positive aspects to having to do what's called brief therapy. Uh, out of the managed care um, uh, movement, there has come a greater emphasis on something called brief therapy. And what that means is that it's more symptom focused. Uh, we look at what's the problem, uh, what's the function of the problem, and we look at intervening. So uh, brief therapy, uh, much like the therapy we looked at uh, last week when we talked about uh, the psychology of mind, is not a childhood of origin type of therapy. What's come out of this is a type of therapy where I need to see you uh, in six visits or less. So one of the positive sides of that is that there definitely is a focus. And there is a belief that, in fact, um, what happened to you at two years old is only relevant if it's showing up in your behavior now. And as a therapist, I've always kind of liked that, as a matter of fact, because in my experience, if you don't connect it with your current behavior, then really it's just an archaeology exposition and it's just a matter of interest. So what we need to do is look at how, uh, at this point, am I acting out those behaviors that aren't working for me. So um, your therapist in a brief therapy model is going to get very specific. Let's take a look at some of the values of this particular approach to counseling. First, we have a focus on financial limits and change, meaning that we're not attempting to try to cure the client. We're not looking at all those underlying issues. We're realizing that financially, we may only have a certain amount of money in the pot. And so we're looking at the most obvious behavioral changes we can make in the moment. The next is, of course, the adult developmental focus, not the childhood of origin. So I'm going to look at what point in your life is this issue um, arising? In other words, is this a point in your life where your children are leaving, where you're at a midlife point? Um, maybe this is a crucial period of time where we need to refocus and take a look at where you want to go from here. So um, I am not going to be particularly interested in all of the yummy details of your relationship with your siblings when you were three. Um, the next is client strengths and resources emphasized, not pathology based. Now, this would be an excellent time to use something like the psychology of mind approach that we talked about last week. What we're focusing on in brief therapy is how have you solved problems before in the past? How do we access the strengths you already have and the resources already available to you? So I'm coming about this looking for areas in which you, in fact, are competent. You know, asking questions like, have you ever experienced something similar to this before? Have you ever felt uh, this kind of challenge before? And what did you do then? Because the truth is, many of us have experienced times in the past where we did successfully handle similar situations. But it's been so long, we don't necessarily remember. So it may be, and particularly in brief therapy, we don't go outside of you to find a solution. Okay, the assumption isn't that you are disturbed and so we're going to have to go find a solution to cure you. The assumption is you're struggling right now, you have the resources, let's poke around and find them so that you can become functional and active as quickly as possible. Now the last of these was the change occurs um, between sessions. Um, it also occurs after sessions. Now this is an important difference. In this way, it's sort of an ego blow to a therapist, of course, but there's less uh, value placed on the actual therapy session itself, which is why a therapy session might be 30 minutes, a therapy session might be um, uh, an hour and a half, okay? Because what you're doing is using that time to combine your energies to come to some sort of plan or solution. It's very concrete. So, it's not uh, what you do is you often are given homework assignments and things you're supposed to work on in between sessions and to find out how you actually do and how you actually cope. So there's not the reliance or dependence on the therapist. The therapist is really more of a, a coach or somebody who is a facilitator. Uh, there is a great dependency on the client to do the work, which ideally is how it's supposed to be anyway. So what we do is we 
say to uh, the client, okay, I'd like you to try this, or why don't you try that, why don't you read this material, uh, maybe you want to go to the self-help group, why don't you come back in a couple weeks or come back next week, and let's see where you are at that point. Uh, part of the belief uh, that's that about this approach is that if I see you five or six times, we reach our goals, then you go off and you do your life. If you run into trouble again, well, that's fine. You call and you enter the system again. So it's sort of like continual therapy where you can pop in and out of therapy as needed. You see, in traditional psychotherapy, you kind of have this where you're working hard and then you plateau, and then you're working hard and then you plateau. And the difference is in traditional therapy, you stay in therapy during the plateaus. Uh, you, don't, you don't end that therapeutic relationship. Where in brief therapy, you work, you stop. You work, you stop. And so you're not continuing as you um, are sort of in that plateau or not much is happening period of time. Okay? So you may have somebody who, over the course of five years, accesses psychotherapy uh, for, uh, three times okay? and maybe benefit as much, depending on the length of times that they're there, as somebody who has been in therapy continually and had several plateaus. So there's a lot of logic behind this thinking. In fact, you know, there are people who've had some really wonderful experiences. Let's take a look. Really? Really, I can't say enough good things about managed care. It worked out just great for me, actually. I had it uh, through the last job that I had, and I was able to go in and have a physical, a complete physical, for the first time in probably 20 years. Uh, I made some return visits to the doctor. It was only $5 a time. You know, I couldn't possibly have done that without managed care, and I felt, I felt as though I had a really good doctor, and. Uh, I had a lot of confidence in her, and if I still had managed care, I'd still be going to her. Now, actually, this person raises um, a common concern people have about managed care, which is, for example, if you go through the Kaiser system, um, the truth is you may not see the same doctor again and again because uh, you may wind up sort of being referred to whoever happens to be on duty at that time. And for some people, that's uh, that's one of the disadvantages because they would like to form an ongoing relationship with their physician and uh, sometimes in this kind of system while you may have a primary physician uh, people you see for further treatment may rotate so uh, that is uncomfortable uh, but like this individual states uh, managed care for him may treatment at all um, possible because the truth is, one of the reasons that managed care ever came to exist is that due to health care uh, uh, costs, just for the average person, more and more people were finding that they couldn't afford uh, health care, and more and more companies couldn't afford to provide health care because they simply uh, didn't have the money. So, you know, when a company's able to hire a managed care company to be the intermediary and contain those costs, Ultimately, even though you may have fewer choices, it may be they can still provide you coverage where if they did not have that chance, they would not be able to provide any coverage at all. So, you know, you do we have to take a look. You know, when you look at your plan over, um, uh, there may be a lack of choices, but at least you have something. Now, one of the responses uh, to managed care for some people that I have seen, at least in the psychotherapy, model is that they have um, become frustrated sometimes by the cap on how many visits they can have. And I am seeing uh, an increased growth in the self-pay market. I'm seeing more people willing to pay out of pocket 
uh, for wellness, willing to pay out of pocket for marital counseling. Because uh, the truth is that when people need a service, often they're willing to pay for it. And so part of what the scary story that we heard in the first half about the physician not treating, the truth is, even with managed care, if your physician is not satisfactory, you do have choices. And some people decide either to switch within the managed care plan or to go outside the managed care and just pay out of pocket. Now, one of the shifts that's happened as a result of that is that there are therapists and doctors in the area who have, in fact, lowered their fees. Now, you may have seen the recent, uh, the recent news, news article, in fact, it was today uh, in the Mercury News, about how this is affecting doctors' ability to make a living. And it's true that uh, doctors' practices have been affected tremendously. Uh, there are many doctors who are either going out of business or having to join larger managed care clinics just to be able to survive. So you can imagine that within the healthcare um, uh, realm, when doctors get together and healthcare providers get together, there is some degree of discouragement because uh, what has happened for the private provider is that we are losing more control over our practice. You know, most people who go into mental health or go into uh, become physicians, they want to work autonomously. And so it kind of has forced a community or group association model that is sometimes difficult for the personalities of physicians and therapists who became one to be isolated to begin with. So uh, you may at times uh, pick up on some discouragement in the clinic where you may go for services, and that's probably what it's about. And I know that therapists and doctors really do need to uh, take a look at how we emotionally are going to continue to adapt to this change because I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Now, what may change is that there will become a very distinct out-of-pocket market and a very distinct managed care market. And in some ways, that's not all of that unusual because it used to be that prior to any insurance, if you had money, you got treatment you didn't have money, you didn't get treatment. Therefore, we have national attempts at health care that cross the country so that we don't begin to have that have and have not split that could potentially happen um, as the out-of-pocket model gets bigger and managed care costs become increasingly contained. I want to thank you for being with us today. I appreciate you spending some time with me learning about managed care. In the upcoming weeks, we'll learn about obsessive compulsive disorder and emotional intelligence. I'm Mary Crocker Gook. Good night. For topic suggestions, write to Bay Area Psychology at 1723 Hamilton Avenue, Suite A, San Jose, California, 95125, or call at 408-448-0333.